to you and thank you for being here today. We're excited that you're here. For those of you gathered here in the sanctuary, it's a big crowd today. And for those of you in the parking lot listening on the radio, we appreciate it. And as always, those folks at home. Let's begin, if we could please, by standing and giving God some praise. For great is his faithfulness, and we want to recognize that today as we praise him together. So would you stand with us? Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. Help us to truly make this time about you. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said amen. amen. As we did last week in lieu of shaking hands and hugging, because right now we can't do it, so just turn and wave at everybody. Tell them you miss them. You're glad to see them this morning. Good. All right. Thank you. Good to see everybody. All right. Thank you so much, and you may be seated. Part of our time of gathering here today is we come to worship and to exalt our loving God. And so let's do that together. I exalt you.
thank you for praising him, and we do want to exalt him today. The next few moments is our prayer time. We're going to ask that if you've not had a good conversation with God today, that this is the moment that you'll do so. So let's take a few moments. Offer up your praises to him. Take your burdens and lay them at his feet. And in just a few moments, I'll close this all out. Let's pray, church. Thank you so much for giving us this time to come today to do just what we sang about, to exalt you and glorify your precious name. We thank you for the opportunity that we can come back into this place that's been set aside for us to worship and to praise your holy name. But we also thank you that during all of this pandemic, the one thing that really was made focus for us was that your church is not a building, but it's the people. But we do still thank you for this place that we can come and collectively worship and to fellowship with each other and with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, as we glorify your name, we also come asking on behalf of others who may be sick caught up in the difficulties and challenges of life, which seem to be even more so during this time. So Father, we need your presence. We need your touch and your direction. For the families that are struggling with the loss of a loved one, Father, we just pray that you make your presence so real to them that they begin to feel your presence through the power of the Holy Spirit to help them to begin to heal. Lord, for those who are facing significant health issues that are beyond description or understanding, we place them in your hands for your will to be done. Thank you, Father, for the freedom of coming to pray and to worship and to glorify your name. Lead us now, Father, we pray as we continue to praise your name. In Jesus' name, we come before your throne in prayer. There's nothing better than to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It is tis sweet when we do that, and so we'll sing that hymn now. As you stand, this would normally be our offertory hymn, so as you sing this song, if the Lord leads, it's just a reminder that there are baskets by all the doors, and you're welcome to drop your tithes and offerings in those baskets as you leave. Let's stand as we give him praise. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for a raise. 
thank you so much, and you can be seated. And as you do, please, would you take out your Bibles and open them with us to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to read a little bit about Paul's letter to the church at Corinth this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. After Kim comes and leads us now in a time of celebration and a time of encouragement through song. So please go ahead and get your Bibles open and be ready. Lee and I like to listen to the Gaithers a lot. We listen to those homecoming videos. And the other day on the way home, I heard the song. It is really old. And I haven't done it in a long time since I was little. So, um, but it's so appropriate for right now because the title of the song is It Feels So Good Just Being Here Again. So listen to these words because it, it, it does make us feel good to be here today. And to see happy faces. It's so nice to see people to look at instead of just the chairs. Gracious God, thank you again. Thank you for that reminder that we have been created for fellowship, first with you and then with others. And it does feel good when the body of Christ can come and meet and celebrate together. Now, Lord, as we open your word, would you guide us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isaiah chapter 1 is our scripture today. <clears throat> Kim will tell you that... Uh, I am, like probably most men, easily entertained. Doesn't take a whole lot to get me interested in something, and even if she looks at it and says, why? That's okay. Some of you probably, one of the shows that I don't watch a whole lot of television in terms of having to keep up with anything, because I don't do real well with that. But The Big Bang Theory was probably one of my favorite shows while it was on. And if you're familiar with that program, you know that there was one particular character on that show named Sheldon who was brilliant. But he spent his entire scientific career chasing this theory that really meant nothing, but he was determined to prove that it was something. And so in this process of trying to prove it, he would always show how intelligent he was. So all the other people who were around him, who were also probably 
as intelligent, or even maybe more in some cases. And I remember one particular episode where they decided to, they just had enough of his acting like he was so smart, and so they were decided they were going to play a card trick on him. And they sat down and they said, here, they're going to deal out this deck of cards, and one person would flip a card over and, and look at it and slide it back in the deck, and then they would sit there for a few moments around the table with a group of people, and the dealer would flip the card and say, is this your card? And it didn't matter what the card was, the other person would automatically say, absolutely, that's my card. And Sheldon got really upset about it because he could not figure out how they were doing it. And he would watch them. And of course, they, it wasn't a trick. It didn't matter what the card was, the other person already knew they were going to say, yeah, that's my card. And it boggled this brilliant mind. And I thought about that today because as Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he's going to talk about the fact that this whole concept of Christ the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is something that's going to absolutely boggle the minds of those people who were in charge of the leaders of that day. So join me, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians beginning, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For, I will, for it is written that I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Now he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 14. But it reminded me of that card trick in this brilliant mind who could not figure it out. Jesus is saying to them, for a lot of people, this whole concept of the cross is absolutely foolishness. I've heard people say, I don't know why somebody has to die for me. I don't need somebody to die for me. But this understanding of the fact that Jesus Christ loved us so very much that he was willing to give his life on that cross for the remission of our sins. And that's a concept that the, the wise could not understand. And so for many of them, this whole idea was absolutely foolishness. And Paul says, for those who don't believe, they're going to perish. But for those of us who believe, we understand what it means to be saved by the power of God. And that salvation comes through that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when he's quoting from Isaiah 29, 14 in verse 19, when he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence I will frustrate. Think about that a minute. So many people who just can't grasp the idea that Jesus Christ loved us so much that he was willing to give everything for us. So that through our faith and trust in him, you and I now have the opportunity to walk daily with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. To know that when we come before him with a repentant heart and ask for forgiveness of our sins, we no longer have to carry the burden of those sins. They're gone. He takes that weight. Verse 20. For where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? The wise men were the experts. They were expected to know everything. The scholars and the scribes were those who were the interpreters and the writers of their day. And the philosophers were the debaters of the day. You may remember when you studied Greek history, there were times when the philosophers would gather and come to the temple and simply just sit and talk and debate philosophy of life. And what he says to them when he understands this whole concept of the cross is that the wise man who is an expert won't be able to understand it. The scholar who is an interpreter or writer will not be able to understand it. The philosopher will not be able to debate it because they simply will not be able to grasp this concept. Verse 21, for since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased with the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. God was pleased with this so-called foolishness of preaching the word of God, of sharing the gospel. God was pleased for those who came to believe and were saved. When I worked in healthcare for about 10 years, one of the things that we had to do ever so often was go to the newest and greatest motivational seminar. Whatever it was, we all had to be a part of it. And they would bring the speakers in and they would line them up and we'd have to go sit in the auditorium for four or five hours and listen to whatever this newest thing was that was better than what we saw last month. And they were sharing all of these ways of doing things better and improving things better and, and how to make us better people. And I often thought about it. 
not a single time in all of those seminars that I attended in those years did, everyone, did anyone talk about the fact that with a relationship with Jesus Christ, we could be better? That a personal walk with the Holy Spirit would make us better? Daily living for Christ, learning to put others first and serve others would make us better? All of this philosophy and wisdom that's out there in the world is absolutely nothing without truly understanding the power of God through his gift of Jesus Christ, his only son. Verse 22, the Jews demanded miraculous signs, and the Greeks, they looked for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. So as Paul is writing this to the church of Corinth, he says, here's what we're all about. This group of people over here, they're not going to believe until they absolutely see, until they have the miracles. And one of the interesting things that we've talked about in our Wednesday night Bible study is that every time they had a miracle, it wasn't enough. They needed more. They needed something else to see. So this group was demanding miracles. And this group over here says, we want wisdom. We want things of philosophy. And all of this stuff about Christ and the cross doesn't make sense. And then Paul says, here's the simple fact. This is what we do. We preach Jesus Christ. We preach the fact that he was crucified for the love of his people. We preach that. And it became a stumbling block for some because they could not believe. They could not open their hearts to it, no matter how much evidence they had right before them. You see, the Jews demanded more signs and miracles. The Greeks, for the cross was not to be considered to be a sign of power, but the cross was a sign of weakness. The cross for them was a sign of destruction. The Jews needed a mighty conqueror, not a child born in a manger and not one killed on a Roman cross. They considered all of this to be foolishness. They laughed at the cross. They, they saw no wisdom in the cross. But look at verse 24. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So for those who have considered it all to be foolishness, no matter which group they're a part of, you find power in Jesus Christ. You find that wisdom that we need. Now, I love the fact that the Bible says for us that some things in the Scriptures, until we're standing face to face with the Lord, we'll never truly understand. It's the mystery of the Scriptures. And that's okay. We may never truly grasp some of it. But here's the thing. When you have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when you understand the amount of love that he gave for us, then we were able to find that power. And we are able to find the wisdom that we need. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were intellectual. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of this world to shame the strong. And when Paul's saying this to those gathered, the apostles, he reminds them, look, think about where you came from. Remember most of the original apostles that followed Jesus Christ were fishermen, tent makers. They were hardworking people. They weren't of noble blood. And yet, these are the ones that Christ specifically called out to serve him. God chose these foolish things to shame those who thought they had all the wisdom. God chose these weak people who make mistakes. And if you study the life of the apostles like we did last year, oh man, did they make some mistakes. But he chose them in their weakness. To be the ones that served him. Verse 28 says he chose the lowly things of this world. And the despised things. And the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. 
It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, our holiness, and redemption. And therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Now think about that for just a minute. What he's simply saying is, the talents, the gifts, the abilities, whatever it is that we have, it's all been given to us by God. And whatever we've been given, whatever those are, we're to simply use those in service to Him as we serve others around us. You see, the world doesn't understand all this concept of Jesus coming and loving and giving absolutely everything. But when your faith and trust is in Jesus, you find the wisdom that you need. You find the strength that you need. When he talks about letting boast, boast in the Lord. You know, I used to see these professional athletes, whenever they win something, say, I give glory to God. And sometimes I wondered how sincere they were. And then I began to think, if they're serious, that's awesome. Because they're not boasting in what they do, they do or they're doing or their talents or their abilities. They understand that what they have is a gift from God. And they're boasting in God. And that's what we need to be doing every day, is boasting in God and what he's doing for us and what he does for us each and every day, not in our own accomplishments, but in what he has done through us and in us, giving him full credit. That's what it means for us when scripture says you and I are to be living sacrifices because Jesus gave his life, but he's asking us to live, living and believing in the power of God even when the world tells us that we're crazy. Finding wisdom that will stump some of the smartest individuals because we have faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I heard someone say, doing a, a scientific definition of something, they asked him about God, and he said, well, you know, God is that thing that, you know, that's why they call it faith, because there's no direct evidence of God. And I thought, you may have missed it, dude, because you don't know about the Holy Spirit. Because when you find the Holy Spirit, when you become that dwelling place for the Holy Spirit, then you know without a shadow of doubt that there is God. Because His presence leads you. It comforts you in difficult times. It gives you strength when you're just not sure that you can go one more step. Because He reminds us that He never leaves us nor abandons us. So see, when you have faith and trust in the cross... The world may say it's foolish, but the Lord says it's wisdom. It's wisdom. So where is your wisdom today? Where is your faith and trust today? I know the world is going to paint this picture that there is no God. They're going to tell you that everything just sort of fell into place and it was all a, a tremendous accident. I don't know about you, but I don't buy that. I can't look around the world and see the beauty and all the creation and the intricacies of life and believe that it was all an accident. For I know his hand is upon us. So if your faith and trust is in him, the world may call you foolish, but you know you have wisdom and power from on high. I pray today that you'll rely on that power and that strength each and every day as you walk daily with him. Would you bow your heads for just a moment, please? These scriptures today basically point out for us that there is actually wisdom in the cross, not foolishness. For the cross of Christ was a symbol that was meant to be something of destruction and weakness. But when your faith and trust is in Jesus, it is an incredible symbol of love. He loved you so very much that he willingly went to that cross and gave his life. Willingly. Because of his love for you and me today. 
The world can call it foolish if they want to. But that's God's wisdom. And that's God's love for you today. You are loved. And every time you see that cross, be reminded of his love for you today. Oh, gracious God, thank you for reminding us today that the whole idea of living a life of faith as the world looks at us, they may not truly understand it. They may not know what we're all about. But Lord, allow us to live in this world and to do our best daily to walk with you, to allow the light of Jesus to shine in us and through us and around us so that we can point others to the hope that we have because our hope is not in this world because they may think it's great and, and philosophies and education we, it has its place, but Lord, we know that all these things are eventually going to crumble and fall. But what you have for us is eternal. And we thank you and praise you for that today. Lord, help us to remember that when we think about the cross, we are reminded that it's not about foolishness, but it's about love. Let us not take that for granted as we live our life each and every day. Lord, there may be somebody here today who needs to put their faith and trust in you. They've never opened their hearts to receive you. And I pray, Lord, that today they'll say, Lord, here I am. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Lord, there may be someone here who's been a part of the body of faith, but they've gotten distracted or gone down a different path. Rekindle, Lord, in them that fire and that desire to have that daily journey with you. Help them, Lord, to come back and to open their hearts to you for that fresh walk and journey. Lord, thank you loving us so much beyond what we can even measure. I pray, God, that as we prepare to leave this place now and go out into the world, that we'll take this wisdom that we've been given and share it through love and compassion to the world around us. Let others see Jesus in us. Because we know that ultimately Jesus Christ paid it all for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus paid it all. I'm going to ask if you'll stand, please, as we sing our closing hymn. Let's give him praise together. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and
that Jesus paid it all. And we are so grateful and thankful today for his amount of love that he has shared for us. Thank you so much for being with us today in person, in the car, or online. And for our children who are here this morning did not get a chance to see the Sunday School lesson and they want to participate, there are some handouts back here on the table. They're welcome to go back and pick one up in the fellowship hall, take it home, and do what you're supposed to do. Follow the directions on the web link and then get it back to us by noon on Saturday so that we can include it in next week's lesson. And we want to thank you so much for participating in that. A couple things to share with you. We're going to try our best to have a, an Easter egg hunt on Palm Sunday, if all weather permitting, because everything's going to be outside. And so please put that on your calendar. Also, on that day, we will have communion here in church. And so we invite you to come and to participate in that. It is very good to see everybody back. And I pray that God will continue to bless you. And I, I just I know that before long, we'll be back in here with all this facial covering and all this kind of stuff. But until then, we're going to be safe and do our best to keep everybody else safe as well. I pray that God blesses you this week. Let's pray. Gracious God, for your many blessings, we say thank you. I ask the Lord as we leave this place that you will guide us and help us to do our best. Because we have good news. And we need to share that good news with the hurting world. Let us be your messengers, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please allow the deacons to dismiss you by rose. Thank you so much. God bless. and look forward to seeing you next week.